Welcome everyone to another of our complete guides. I'm Neil from 3D Tudor and oh boy is this an amazing guide. I think by now we're up to number 22 or 23 on how many guides we actually have on YouTube so make sure to check those out. Now this one is a complete guide done entirely in Blender 3. That includes all the materials which we'll be using nodes to create. It also includes all of the particle systems and animations for the clouds and things like the sparks. Now before we get started, a few words about our sponsor today, and that is, yep, 3D Tudor. That's us, because we're not big enough to get some big sponsor to come along and support our work. But we do have something better than that, and that is our Patreon, where you'll find every guide we have ever done, complete with all the blend files, materials, and textures. Now this is pretty standard across most Patreons you may see out there. But here at 3D Tudor, we want to do something a little bit different. In other words, we want to give you a whole lot more. This is because the more Patrons we get, the more free stuff we can keep creating. In fact, if we get to around 150 Patrons, we can hire another Pro Blender or Unreal Expert to pump out even more quality content. And of course, free stuff on top of that. So what do we give here at 3D Tudor via our Patreon? Well, over 350 hours of complete courses. Every month, you'll get to choose a course and it will be delivered right to your email. And best of all, you can pick which course you would like out of our vast library of over 23 courses. And the courses aren't just on Blender. We have courses on Unreal Engine, Photoshop, ZBrush, and for sure you're going to find some Substance Paint courses in there as well. So please check us out over on our Patreon, links are down below. Finally, before I finish, as kind of the icing on the cake on our Patreon, you will find on there this animated blacksmith house, but in its entirety. There isn't any commentary that comes with it, but it is the full 9 hour uncut version. So that's all from our sponsor, now what you're here for is to see how we put together our blacksmith house. So enough of all the spiel, let's get started on our animated stylized blacksmith shop. Cheers everyone. And here we are in the modeling section of Blender 3.21, which I might upgrade actually in the next week or two to the new 3.3 I think it is. And you look there and what I first of all did is I actually brought in my HDR lighting and I brought in my human OBJ. And that's important actually if you're working just in Blender because you wanna make sure that all those materials that you're actually putting on there actually look right. So I find it easier if I'm just working in Blender without Substance Painter to actually bring my lighting in, you know, in the first instance. And we have a HDRI set up there, which has a gradient and things like that, which is available by the way for uh, free download actually from our Gumroad. So you can see as well that I've also picked the actual chimney to start. I always normally pick something that's, you know, a smaller part of the actual full build rather than starting with the house. All right, so let's move on to the modeling then. So what I've done there is I bought in an actual cylinder. I brought it down. Then what I did is I split up the actual faces using Y and then I basically used uh, solidify a bevel and created that little oval um, part you see there, that hole. And then what I did was I just created some some just uh, blocks, basically used a bevel and made them look like bricks. And this is really handy if you don't want to use bricks over the entire surface of the chimney and just, you know, make it really kind of stylized by just adding a few bricks in there. Now what I'm doing is I'm creating the top of the chimney. Same sort of thing here. You can see though that I can't actually um, fill those faces in. So what I did was I filled two of the faces in, leave me one face empty and then you can actually um, create actual faces. Really, really easy technique there. All right, so I'm just adding a few more bricks just to give this, you know, some variations and things like that. I'm grabbing those bricks, I'm putting them in the corners, and what I'm doing is I'm just making them look different for each other. Next of all, what I did were, there, I actually went, I pressed tab, I went into face select, and I actually randomized the faces a little bit just to make them jut out a little bit uneven. All right, so now I'm going to use a subdivision. I used a remesh on this um, actual part, and then all I'm doing is I'm just going into my sculpt, and just making it a little bit uneven. So really, really easy stuff. Now these are the logs, so again, all you do is you get the top face, you use I to actually insert it, and then what you're doing is you just bring bevel in the edges like so, and there's your logs done. So you can see, pretty easy to get that first bit out of the way. So now what I'm doing is I'm playing around with materials. These are the first materials, so I'm making sure that everything's named. It's important as you go on, and you create your materials that you do name them because if not you're going to have a real problem in the end of actually 
you know, creating uh, all of these materials because it's going to be a lot of material. So we've got wood in it and wood out for our logs. And as I go on as well, a bit later on, I mess around with the materials just to get them right. Now you can see that um, that fire, it actually has an emission map on it. I do go in and change that in a, in a bit just to make it look a little bit like fire. Now on that I used a simple deform on that actual mesh there and I basically twisted it so you can use simple deform twist just to get that really really nice look. Now what I did there was I used something called loop tools. It's an add-on free built within Blender and what you can do is you can get a face, you can divide it up grab the few middle faces that you want and then right click click and you'll see it at the top and you can create a circle then out of uh, those faces you can see i'm trying to bring it in <laughs> and i've not split it up so it's not actually working out too well so now i've actually split them up i'm using the solidify i'm bringing it in and then i'm just going to turn it just make it really really uneven going all the way around and actually look like bricks so pretty much at the moment what we're doing is we're splitting faces up we're using either solidify or extrude to bring them in and then we're using a bevel modifier once we've filled in the little gaps and things like that. Alright, so we know this wants to be um, molten uh, metal. So what I tend to do on something like this is, I'll bring in a circle, I'll um, press F to fill it in, and then I'll press I and bring that actual uh, edge loop all the way to the center, and then you can press Ctrl R and you make a load of edge loops, and then you'll get that actual uh, that nice mesh that you're actually looking for. On flat meshes, unfortunately, very, very difficult to remesh in Blender, so. So now I'm creating an actual bellows, and these were actually quite difficult to animate, so I'm sure you'll be interested in that. So once they're created, the problem is that once you move the top bellow, it actually interferes with the bottom bellow, so we have to go in and change the weight of the actual animation. You can see I made a bit of a mess of it there. I should have brought it out um, even, but I didn't, so I just decided to bring it up. And I know they'll still look right because they are made of wood and they might have that little, um, you know, uh, rotation on them, so. All right, so we're pretty much now finished with the bellows. So now you can see I'm bringing in the actual first part of the armature. And I'm actually gonna go over and make sure I name this because um, not only do you want to name all the bones, you want to rename the armature because if you are taking this through to uh, Unreal Engine, uh, Blender, as I've said before, has a bug where the armature won't go straight through. You can see now what I'm doing is I'm actually trying to um, move it up and down as you can see, but we're getting too much weight on the bottom so what's happening is it's actually pushing the bottom down too far. So what I need to do is I need to bring in another bone, reweight it again, and actually um, just do this part again and put some weight on that bottom bow. So you can see now, once I've got this, when I bring that, you can see it's not going actually in as much and that's exactly what we're looking for. Now you always want a root bone. You can see there, there's a bone there not really doing anything. That bone basically wants parenting up to one of the, um, well, to the mesh basically. Now normally you can't um, parent the bone up to the mesh directly. So what you need to do is you need to have a main point on the mesh that's not weighted by anything, so it's like a separate object, and then you weight that actual root bone to that separate object, and then everything is parented again to that separate object. So basically that main block or whatever will have parents from the bone and from the actual object, and then you can simply move it around quite easily. Because you can't have um, basically uh, one being a parent and then that being a parent, you can't actually work like that. All right, so now that's done, we're just moving on now. To actually bringing in um, some stone and I wanted a bit of variation with my stone so what I decided to do is you can see there I brought in a grey gradient and then what you can do is when you put it on you can see there I can actually grab each one individually and just move them across that actual gradient it makes it really really easy actually to do that what you can also do as well is instead of unwrapping it like I've done here where it's a, it's a little bit of a mess, it doesn't matter in this instance, but what you could just do is go over the top of the actual object and just do project from the view because then it'll just actually put them close together anyway. So now you can see I've got my, again, my mission in. Now it's time, um, I think on this, to actually bring in some um, proper uh, emission like maps or notes setups and you'll see me do that in a minute. I'm not sure whether I should keep uh, this brass, I made it a, just a brass colour but I think actually in the end probably better off wearing it as metal actually. And the beauty of working in Blender like this is very very you know simple materials and things like that. 
So our first uh, mission and what we're doing here is we're just creating those kind of floating sparks that come off of the molten metal. So you can see spark flame here. And I'm just first of all getting that material right, getting the shape right, and then I'm going to go into my particle system and change it from render as not halo, render as object. And there we go. Now you can see we're kind of getting somewhere once we've actually turned off our gravity. So we've turned off our gravity, you can see them now floating in the air. And now what it's a matter of bringing down how many there is, changing the shapes and randomizing everything. So you want to randomize pretty much everything. That's like your rotation, your direction a tiny, tiny bit and the scale of course just make sure they're big enough so now we're going moving on to the actual emission map and you can see i'm using a musgrave here and just then kind of getting the right actual um colors and things like that because you will notice that the closer we get in should be it should be whiter as we come in as you can see they're white and then maybe sometimes a deep red like i've put in there or you can see that extra noise really actually added to uh, to my molten um, metal. Now you can see with the fire, <laughs> I don't want the same thing. I want to change that because the fire is it needs to be different colors. So you can see that I actually brought in a, a different noise. I think it's Veroni, is it? Yeah, it's a Veroni instead of the Musgrave. Now the other thing I'm doing with the uh, molten um, metal is I want it to slightly move. Now the thing is, once you actually uh, move it, 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 you will actually look as though it's repeating. So you can see it stops and repeats. So what I tend to do with just something like this, I just have it swaying backwards and forwards. It just makes it much, much easier. You can put drivers in, in this, and I do do that a bit later on. But with this one, what I did was, I just moved it slightly uh, to the right, then slightly to the left, and we have just that continuous motion. And there you go, you can just see it just swaying around. That's probably more actually realistic anyway, so. All right, so just putting those in place, um, getting everything set up, looking at kind of like a tertiary look at the actual scale, and now I'm gonna bring in the house. And the reason I'm bringing in the house at this point is because I need, I built kind of two big uh, objects that are going in the scene, and now it's time to actually build the house so I actually have a good understanding of how big the actual scene is and what I can actually fit in there as well. And you can see I pretty much grey box this house out how I actually want it to look. Simple house, I just got um, some renders off of uh, Sketchfab and then what I did was I just uh, you know put them on my Pura as you've seen me do and as we talk about in our courses. By the way, all of this stuff that I'm doing here, um, except the animations, um, well, some of the animations are in our courses, but they can be found in our courses pretty much. We just take it to probably a higher level, actually, than what we're doing here. And also, guys, if you can drop some messages uh, down below. Uh, it does help the, uh, you know, the channel grow and things like that. And not only that, we get an idea of what you're struggling on, what you might like to see next, things like that. So please drop us any messages you might have down there. All right, so same technique again with this. You can see I split them up, filled in the faces, beveled them off, and it's just a really, really easy technique to get anything, you know, to do with stone or anything like that. On this one as well, I'm not actually going to put a time of how long it took or anything like that at the end, but I can tell you it took roughly around six hours or something like that of building. So you can see because we put so much into this, a lot of it was animated, a lot of it was a mission, that did take up a lot of time. If we're just going to build this, I would say it would take about an hour maybe, maybe an hour and a half at the most, something like that. So not too long to actually build it all out. So now we're just working on the actual tree stump where the axe is going to go in. And again, for all of this, what I did was I actually got references for the, uh, you know, for the chimney, for, for the uh, forge, things like that. I just get basically references on everything, even though they're quite simple, um, I still get a reference on them, especially for the anvil, because I want this to look really nice. So it's gonna be a simple anvil. Um, you know, just basically a lot of the, uh, you know, the material's pretty much gonna be the same. We could have added some noise to the actual material, but in the end, we decided not to. And there you go, I'm using an actual curve to actually uh, create that point. It's just the easiest way of doing it, because you can press Alt S, on, the, on anywhere in the curve, and, and you can actually bring that down independent to the rest of it, and it gives a really nice slope to it. You can see I'm just filling in that topology, and the reason I'm doing that is just to get that nice sharp edge at the bottom there. Uh, without filling that topology and having engons, you won't actually get that. So now, as well, I'm creating the sparks first. 
ready for when this hammer comes down and we can create that mission. Now this is the hardest part of the entire build if you're going to take this on because you need to bring that hammer down and when you bring that hammer down sparks need to fly just as it hits that actual anvil so you need to take that into account. It's quite a complex thing this because the hammer has to come down, the sparks have to fly and you need to put all of that into an emission. So now we're going to bring in first of all the hammer animation so I'm just going to go to the hammer now. And there we are, bringing the bone, renaming my armature. And then wait it, the hammer animation is quite easy, it's just a stroke of up and down. So I'm just rotating it from that point there. You can press your little sideways V next to the question mark on your keyboard. And then what you can do is you can make your rotation come from your cursor, which makes it also very easy. So now we've got, once we've got the actual hammer animation, as you can see, into place, then we can actually bring in our emission. I also want to fit it into 180 frames, so I've made sure I've actually done that. And here we are, this is our emission. Now we don't need the whole thing, so I do cut away the bottom of it. And what we're going to do first of all is change the emission from, you know, those kind of circles to our actual object that we've already created. So instead of halo, you just put it on object. You will need some gravity on this because you want the sparks to come out, fire out, and then drop down. Now the other problem you're going to have is you don't want the sparks there all the time. So what you want to do is you want to bring in a cube and you'll see me do that in a minute. And what I'm going to do is every time um, that drops down into the cube, the cube is going to be set as killing particles. So you'll see it's like a collision and it kills particles and what happens is the actual emitter it just goes up and down it just sways up and down and when it's down it's actually in the um, particle killer which is the cube which is basically a collision and that's the way you actually do this now you don't want it to collide with the actual anvil but you do want it to collide with the floor so you make sure as well that you've got collision on the floor and now you can see how quickly that goes up so it comes up down and it just stays there until the hammer comes down it comes up really fast emits the sparks and then goes back down again and then you get this really really nice look as you can see it is a fairly uh, tricky to get all of this into place and you can see I don't think at the moment I've got the cube there so what happens is you end up with sparks kind of coming out of the actual anvil which is not something you want as well all right, so you can see now I've got it in place. I've got it coming up and down. You can see now that it's short if I grab it. There we go. And there you go. There's the particle killer. So it's a meter block, as you can see. And they set for it on collision. Turn on kill particles. And there we go. Now you can see that these sparks, every time that comes up, sparks come out. And then they stop every time it goes down. And that's exactly what I want. Now, if you want to bring this into, um, you know, sketch or, uh, fab or something like that, there is um, actually a, a code, a piece of code that you can uh, put in to actually, um, you know, have this sent through to uh, Sketchfab, but I actually didn't do that, so it's a lot of work. If I'd have just done these sparks, I would have sent that through, but that's one of the reasons we didn't go in Sketchfab, because not only are we doing sparks, we're doing all these other emitters, we've got, um, you know, materials on there which are created in Blender, which would mean, actually, you'd need to bake all of those materials out on top of them, running all these scripts and things like that to get the particles in basically that script changes those particles into actual mesh um, and then when they you know when they actually uh, die it basically changes the scale to zero and that's how it works we've got clouds in there and all kinds of things so i just didn't have the time to actually do that so all right so now i'm moving on to the roof and just a simple roof here instead what i did with the gray i just changed it to a, a blue um, again gradient I actually marked the seams as well ready and what that means is because I'm going to use a array um, modifier it means that already all the seams are in there as well so I'm just going to use two arrays so two lots of arrays and, and basically two by two so the first array is going to go downwards and across but skip every other one and then basically I'm just going to copy that and just move them to the side like you can see me do here making them look a little bit more realistic 
You can see as well that I'm messing around with the angle, making sure that they all go, you know, nice and down really cleanly. Also, when I've uh, finished this, I bring it in, I use a simple deform, I um, make a duplicate of it because I know I'm going to need another one on that other part of the roof. And I think I use a simple deform here, let's just see. I think I actually bend it in a little bit. And you can see here that I've got to stretch some out and make some smaller just to make them fit that last point. So that's the easiest way of doing it actually. And there we go, then we just mirror it over the other side, bring in our other one. And the easiest way to do this is just cut everything away with the uh, bisect tool. It makes it really, really easy then to do that. And again, because we're using uh, simple materials, we can really get away with a lot more. We don't have to actually go in and tidy up all those edges and things like that. There you go with the simple deform. So I'm just actually just bending it out a little bit, then I'm going to mirror it over. And you can see that it adds actually a lot onto this build. And you can see, not quite in the middle there, I'm trying to move it over and thinking, why is that not in? And the reason is that the center of mass wasn't quite in the middle. So move that over and then it fitted absolutely perfectly. All right, so here's my kind of blue. I really like this sort of blue. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move them all over and actually because they just fitted really nice so I didn't bother splitting them up or anything and moving them into each individual one. I just left them as is because they did look nice anyway. Alright so the final bits on here before I go back to it because now I've got it in place I might as well leave it, go away, think about what else I'm going to be doing with it and then I can come back to it and actually uh, you know create the other pots in it or um, you know windows and things like that and that's exactly what I'm going to do. Important when you're working with something like this actually you stick to the same style it's very easy to get lost uh, on a tangent and basically create you know more realism than stylized uh, stylization and also I struggle with that as well you've got to make everything really chunky you've got to take a step back and say okay does this actually fit the scene is it chunky enough you know, can I add anything else to make it a little bit more stylized and all those sort of things? And that's what I did, you know, a lot of time when I was building so things just, you know, I, I tried to get or steer away from the, you know, type of realism and think more like, you know, World of Warcraft uh, type thing. Although it's probably a little bit more stylized than that even. All right. So now as well with your, with your house, when you're building anything like this, once you brought in those corners, then it's time to try and make everything fit together and then you can build around it. So you can see here. This is my plan anyway, to have a, a kind of window here um, with some uh, boards that are on the uh, sides of it and things like that. Well, window shutters basically is what I mean. So again, once I'm having in the wood now, change over the materials and what I'm doing is just bend them into place, just trying to fit that actual roof that we've already created and give it that stylized look as well. You can see that I'm just uh, actually, sometimes I add pieces of wood as well to hide other pieces, but actually they, they look realistic, so you can see that's what I'm trying to do there. Rather than, uh, you know, put those two pieces of wood together, they would look okay, but it looks better actually with some support on there anyway. If something juts out like that as well, it's not going to be really realistic, even in a stylized theme for it just to jut out with nothing supporting it. So now what I'm doing here is I'm actually creating the actual um, stone slabs that go around the floor. So I divided up my actual base and then I'm just going to go in and actually press delete and uh, limit and dissolve and get rid of all of those actual um, subdivisions once I've actually created this. Now the thing is here I wanted to bring them um, you know, um, back but the thing is if I brought them back as you can see I'm bringing them back and it's actually creating that kind of angle and I don't really want that because I want these stone slabs to be perfectly straight. So what I did was I went to the first edge loop, I brought it back and then I copied the um, amount of length that I brought it back by and then just repeated that on the other one. I did that for both sides as well. All right, so just uh, building out now what I'm actually going to do with this. So I know that I'm going to create this little jutting out part. I'll have a signpost there. And because it's a kind of diorama, we always want to think about how it's gonna look from you know near enough every angle or at least I try and do that so you can see there's a lot going on at this angle but is there anything at the front and now there is because we've got those steps and as we move around to the back and the sides is there anything going on there well the actual side of it you can see that we've got clouds kind of popping over the um, the actual roof and things like that and that's why I always put windows and I don't just leave it blank at the back 
I brought in some bricks, I put some windows in, some shutters, things like that, and just give a bit of life to the, uh, the actual sides and backs of it, which you should always do. And you can see now that I've got my house in, I'm moving off of my house and I can actually build out the rest of the scene because now I have a clear idea of how big everything's uh, going to be and how it's all going to fit together. So I recommend like you bounce around your scene a little bit. And the other great thing now is that I know how much I need to put into the scene because it's not only um, you know what I can, what I need to leave out. In other words, how much uh, space I've actually got because honestly, with something like this. You can put a lot of details, a lot of things um, into it. You can just carry on going and going. But if you actually stick to now this floor plan that we've got here, now we can kind of fit, know what we've got to fit into there. So that's really good. So now I'm just messing around a little bit with the EV render. In the end, I don't actually, um, you know, uh, render it on EV. I actually use cycles because it, you know, EV is really, really good for real time rendering. Um, but, tr but something like this, probably better off rendered in cycles, to be honest. And some people might disagree with that. But that's my own preference. So now let's come in and create our actual um, signpost. Again, I got a lot of references for this of how I was going to create it, and I wanted it to be a bit ornate. I feel as if you know they were a blacksmith; they're going to make the sign a little bit ornate just to get people in the shop. So I am thinking about that as I build. Quick knife tool there just to cut away those parts, make those into planks, bring them in. And I think at this stage, yeah, they're here I'm making the actual grippers. So those types of grippers that put things in the uh, in the fire, I'm going to just make a, a kind of stylized version of those for the actual uh, signpost. And you can see because they're created for the signpost as well, they're huge. They're they're much bigger than they should be. So no one would be able to handle these. So. Turn them on an angle just to give them a bit of variation. And now it's time for the chains. What I did for the chains is I used the curves. I brought in a circle. And that then gives me the ability to mess around with the chain um, as much as I want. You know, to get the right chunkiness and things like that. In the end, this actual uh, chain, it was a little bit chunky. So I went in and I just uh, brought them down a little bit. Now we could have used geonodes or something like that to create the chain. But honestly, if you're not going to be moving a uh, chain around or anything, and it is just simple chain like this, then just, just do it basically by freehand like I've done here. So again, another simple armature. You can see me rename the armature to sign. And then all I'm gonna do is just weight those, not the top chain, just the one down from it against that actual uh, bone there. And then uh, you can use uh, interpolation bezier. That's the one you wanna use. And then what it does is it gives you a really nice weighting to your sign and things like that. That's also actually really important that you get that weighting right. So it is interpolation and then you use the beds here once you've got everything. So basically you go into your timeline, press A to grab all of those um, keys and things like that and then just right click on your timeline you'll see one that comes up with interpolation and just use uh, beds here as I say. Alright so now we've got it in, we've parented everything up to the actual post that's there. So if I do move this signpost, everything will move with it. That's really important. And there we go, we're pretty much finished for the signpost. All right, so now it's time for the windows just to bring some life to the house. You can see that I did a bit of a quick calculation, seeing how much I could get out of it. And I'm basically just bringing in the windows so I know how many I'm gonna need. And it ended up with three windows. So now I'm just gonna insert them all, delete the backs of them, and do them all at the same time because that's going to make it pretty easy. How many glass panes do I want in there? Now I know with the glass panes I'm actually going to be using emission so I ain't got to worry about you know dirt and grime and things like that. So it's pretty much the same technique as what I did for the uh, stone. Basically split them up and brought them out with extrude, filled in those holes, beveled them and with the sensors of them basically I brought in a edge loop. So an edge loop going one way going the other way just to get my paints grab those edge loops, press Control B, and then you'll be able to bevel them out, extrude them out then, and there you go, you've got your piece of wood. Do it independently from the windows, and then you can keep that wood kind of back like it would be in real life as the actual frame. Now I brought in a meat, now I brought in a meat ball and ball on this, so basically if you um, 
If you go over and press Shift A, then you can see there's one that's called a meatball, and then just bring in, and you can see there, that's the one it is. And the reason for that is, is because then we can actually bring it all together, kind of squish it all together, and the law kind of look like them clouds. So you can see it's just a stand emitter, but with a meatball. When we bring those up then, they actually basically all come together like that. Whereas if you didn't use a meatball, you'd br they'd all look like they're independent from each other. So that's why we did it in that way. Now the main problem I had here, which took so long was, trying to get the actual clouds to line up. So in other words, one, once it got to 180, the end of the cycle, it would basically just restart again. And that's not what I wanted. I want it to be kind of, kind of a continuous loop as close as possible. We don't want it jumping um, so much and, that, and that's what I'm trying to do here. So what I did in the end is you can see on the frame start I've put it at minus 180 and what that means is that this actual emitter starts um, at z it doesn't start at zero, it basically starts at 180 so you're not seeing the actual first parts of the emitter where the emitter is coming out. So to get, that's what I mean, to get around that you basically put it at minus 180 in this case and finish at 180 and then make sure the angle is actually correct. So make sure that the angle is, you know, correct at the start, correct at the end, and then they should line up relatively well. Now, of course, they'll never line up perfectly, but it's a way just to get around them looking as though they're, you know, the emitter's restarting or something like that. All right, so now I've done that, what I'm working on now is the actual clouds. Um, I want some variation in them, so what I do is I use the texture coordinates with mapping and put that on normal. What that means is it'll actually um, create the illusion of we actually have some variations in the clouds depending on where the normals are actually facing. So a really, really nice technique to get a kind of gradient, but not a gradient, it's based on normal instead. And you can just see that mesh now, how nice it actually looks because we did it that actual way. So it's a really nice technique there. All right, so now I'm moving on, I think, I'll just wait till it comes up because I, yeah, it's the actual, um, the grind wheel. So with something like this as well, it's, it's fairly complex. This is probably a second in complexity, um, to the actual anvil that we created. So what I'm doing is first of all, I'll create all the parts. So I'll create the grind wheel and I want to bring it to life. So I'm creating them, um, separately. Basically that grind wheel is separate from that other part. Uh, anything that's turning basically you don't want it to attach to anything and I'm also creating a belt there but I don't actually want to go into the complexity of driving that belt round as well I really don't want to do that on this build because that will take a, another hour or so you know making drivers and things like that like you would for a tank or something I don't want to do that so what I did is instead I just left the actual um, belt there and then just made everything else kind of move now one other thing is when you've got a circle and you don't bevel it and you make it spin round, you'll never see it spinning. So you, you need to kind of bring some variation into it, it, which is what I do. You can see, first of all, I brought in a bevel. It's not um, so, it's quite chunky, the circle, so you see all those edges going round. Next of all, I used um, add mesh. So there's an extra mesh it's called on the add-ons. And in there, you'll find, once you press shift A and you go down there, you'll find that you have one that's called gears. So what I did was, I brought in two gears, I uh, upped the amount of um, teeth on one of them, and then I scaled them down at the same time. And what that enables me to do now is make an actual skinning gear, because the teeth will actually fit interlock into each other. They just won't turn at the same pace, and that's perfectly okay. Now, if I was a bit smarter, I'd be able to work out with how fast this uh, bottom gear would turn in relation to the side gear, and then I'm able to rotate them around very easily. But what I actually had to do instead of that is I had to go in, start the uh, small gear, and then go in and every five frames um, actually insert a key with the large gear. So that was a kind of a pain. Probably could have done it better than that by using a bit of math, but. Okay, so now we're just getting all these bones in place, and it's important, of course, to make sure that your bones are dead in the center. That top bone there that you can see there is going to give a little bit of wobble to that actual uh, grindstone on the left hand side there. So that's why I'm putting that there. And there you go. So that took a little bit of work uh, just to get that in, just a, a bit of time just to make sure that's turning properly. But in the end I knew that 
kind of every five um, frames or something like that is going to make it work really nice. So in the end, actually, as well, I didn't even bother checking. What I did was I just rotated it, made the, the teeth bit, and then at the end I just turned it and it all actually went in really nicely. So that made it easy as well. You can see it's a lot of frames that would added. So you can see once I've done it, I give it a test. I'm like, okay, that's working fine. And there we go. That's good. All right, and now I'm giving a little bit of wobble, as I say, to that uh, grind wheel there, as you can see. So now you can see it's wobbling. And basically that is the main part of the actual, uh, you know, grind wheel done. So now once I've done that, I can actually start building out the rest of it. Need a little seat for him to sit on. Could have put something like a little foot paddle or something like that for him to press to actually get it moving. Not sure really how this is going to work, whether it would be, uh, you know, electric or whether it would be, uh, you know, with some kind of uh, fuel or something like that. Wasn't really thinking about that at this stage, it just looked nice, so sometimes that's the way we go. But what I want to make sure, as you should do with all your builds, is just make sure that, you know, it's all kind of together and it looks solid as though, you know, everything's being supported, everything's kind of playing a role. Uh, you will notice when you build things that generally things play roles you know in, in what they actually do to make up the actual object that you're creating so that's quite important don't have things that are stuck off it for, for no real reason you know uh, unless it's a real ornate piece but something like this it's in a blacksmith shop so just take into mind that everything has to be there for a reason normally and you can see it all looks really solid and even though um, you know not everything is like you know kind of understanding how the thing works you can see it still looks really really nice and goes together as a really nice simple stylized piece all right so now i've got to figure out like which bits are going to be metal which bits are going to be wood and things like that and make a another material for the actual uh, grindstones because when uh, as i said when you first start turning that the render it looks good in that but you can't really see the wheel moving so better off bringing in um you know something that gives a bit of noise to the actual texture, which is what I'm going to do now, as you can see. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring texture coordinates in, bring in a noise, and there we go, as simple as that. Reduce the actual um, color ramp down a bit, a bit, so it's not, you know, so black and white, and that's all I'm going to do. So now you can see that when that wheel turns, we can see all that noise move in, and it just it makes it look um, not only uh, more realistic, but also the fact it makes it, um, all that work that you're going to make that wheel move, it actually makes it pay off. So you can see I'm having a few problems um, actually putting it all together. So parenting it all. And this is what I talked about a little bit earlier on in this guide is that you might struggle uh, parenting things up. And the best way to do it is just to bring in a block. So another block on its own, independent from the rest of it. And then you attach the, not only the actual asset that you've built like this, but also the actual, um, all the bones as well. So whenever you want to move this thing then, all you need to do is move that um, that piece, you can just grab it with that piece and everything will move with it because that's another reason why we put a root bone in. A root bone basically ties the all the rest of the armature to that root bone. So everything moves with that root bone and that's the only purpose the root bone actually serves. It doesn't serve anything for waiting, anything for animation, anything like that, it's just a bone that moves the rest of the bones. All right, so now we've actually finished that, we can start bringing everything into a kind of place where we want it, and then we can start moving on and creating the tools and things like that, because that's something else we're gonna need. I had a fairly good idea like of what actually I wanted in this scene. The only kind of uh, stipulation was don't build uh, too too much, do you know what I mean? Because as I said, we could have carried on with this scene for another 10 hours quite easily, uh, but there has to be a cut off point because you know, we've obviously got a limited amount of time and resources uh, that we can build these guides for you. So we don't actually make um, a lot of money um, off these uh, guides or anything like that. We don't get paid a huge amount by YouTube. Um, we, we, we sell them at $2.99, which is a small amount. So it certainly doesn't pay for someone's wages. We basically do them so that you guys can have a good idea of not only how we uh, you know, create things or how things are created, 
what also what our teaching style is, so the things that you're going to learn on our courses and things like that, but also to actually get you into Blender, learn about how to use it, you know, just in case you ain't got the money, um, for instance, and you don't want to buy a course or anything like that. These guides, if you actually slow them down, um, you will actually be able to see pretty much what we've actually done. So, All right, so you can see here now we're creating the actual window shutters. And again, this is a good idea because not only do they look good, but it gives you some variation within your uh, scene as well. It actually brings it more to life rather than just having... Sorry about that, it was a motorbike outside, <laughs> having a uh, just a window stuck on a wall or something like that. So that's why we actually created those. Also, it means we can actually take those um, you know, wooden shutters and put them on the back and sides and things like that. And, and as I say, bring a bit of life to the back of it, because as you can see the back here, there isn't really a lot going on. Now, if you stood back and you took a, an angle uh, from the actual back, you would see the smoke kind of rising you know above the actual roof and that then gives it a bit of life to it so that's what we're actually going for now obviously the other side of the roof is actually really jutted out and this one's not so this one's just a case of bringing in some you know kind of um flat um type wood and things like that which makes it a lot of, a lot easier but because it actually looks uh, flat and it's not jutted out so much we need to bring in something to actually give a little bit of life to this one so what you do is just bring in some shutters and just angle them at a different angle making it look you know as though it's actually lived in and that's what we did with this one as you can see it's just angled that little bit over storytelling is what you're looking for now a lot of people when they do the storytelling they only tell the story from the actual uh, front of it and you'll notice a lot of um, models on sketchpad and things like that is when you go around the back it's basically just a, a blank wall with nothing there and the best ones if you look at them they're the ones that tell the story all the way around so if it's in um, you know it could just be the back just build an alleyway build some um, you know some bins and things like that put some rubbish there maybe a bike or something and then you'll start adding a lot more depth to your actual builds now all I'm doing here is I'm basically just bringing in all the tools. I'm going to start, um, you know, just making some simple tools like a horseshoe, a hammer, things like that. And what I'm also going to do is I'm going to use the grease pencil against that flat uh, plane there just to make my tools that I need. So I'm going to do them all in one go as well because that makes it a lot, lot easier. Now these bits I'm building here, they're like the grippers of the actual tool. So I want to make sure that they're different. Now you can see, look we can actually, they look like usable tools and we basically just uh, duplicated them. So you can see now I'm just messing around with the resolution on the actual curve because you have the ability to do that because it is drawn out curves basically. Alt test to bring them in to make them a little bit sharper on the ends of them. And then just put some uh, kind of, um, you know, things on top where they're going to hook into. Again, because it's a blacksmith, um, he would have just got his tools, welded something to the top of them and used that then to actually hang them up. You know, everything is, uh, is done in a way where it's, it's, it's meant to be usable and not so much worried about um, on how things look, for instance. That's important when you build as well. Think about the actual world that you're trying to uh, build, even if it's something as simple as this. So a hook is just going to be a piece of metal hammered in and create a hook from it. It's not going to be anything really ornate. And because I wanted this scene to be, I, I wanted the main point of this just to bring everything to life and just to show you guys how you can actually easily bring things to life. Once you understand like how to uh, create a armature on one thing and, and put some weights on and things like that, then you should be able to bring all your scenes to life fairly easy. Now, again, we've took it from, um, you know, one small level of weighting something and moving it and animating it all the way up to you know animating clouds and things but generally with this guide you're actually going to get the whole shebang you're gonna you, got, you can see how we uh, create not only emissions we can see how we can create clouds and things like that but also armatures the simple basics of creating an armature the only thing we don't cover here really is weighting too much um, if you're building something like a character rig or something Obviously, a lot more of that rig depends on weight, and so how much weight you have on the joints and things like that will determine how your character's arms move and, and all that stuff. Here it's pretty much the weight is 100% on the actual, um, you know, mesh, 
and then all we're doing is just rotating the bone. So it's it's a little bit simplistic, but it should give you a good idea of how to go forward in the future. So as I said, I wanted everything moving, everything uh, lifelike. Not lifelike, sorry, everything brought to life. Alright, so now we've done that, time to actually give it some uh, material. Pretty much at this stage, we've got most of the material we're going to need, so that's really handy. And now it's a case of just bringing that material to each of these parts. You don't want hundreds and hundreds of materials in something like this anyway. I mean, it, he would have, or she would have, just used the same materials over and over again because they would have built with the same things, only had access to certain types of metal, for instance. Um, they're not going to be building a lot of uh, bronze here or anything like that. It's going to be mainly some basic metal work, so just take that into account. This is just using a gradient, by the way. You can see already, uh, set that where it says, uh, make sure it's on linear. And you can play around those with B-spline and things like that on that actual color ramp. And what that'll do is it'll merge the colors in a little bit nicer. So it's just a gradient and then merging the colors with the color ramp. All right, so rather than build new logs, I just stole them off the fire, pulled them out a little bit, made them a little bit different. And there we go, logs done. And that's that made that easy. All right, so just a quick axe here. Uh, at this point, after watching this, axes should be pretty easy. And all I did with the handle is, I just grabbed it, beveled it off, beveled the top, beveled the bottom, and there we go, that's a simple axe done as well. That's the joy about working with things like this, they're very, very simple, you just need to have a good idea how you're actually going to bring them to fruition. With the actual bucket, it's the same thing again, brought in a cylinder, split them off, so every single face is split off from one another, extrude them in or solidify them, and then basically fill in the holes if you've used extrusion. Um, with this solidify, uh, you might not need to do that as well because it should fill in the uh, gaps for you. And then basically I used the um, the random uh, just to pull them up. Sorry, the random is the proportional editing is what I mean. So proportional editing, use that set on random. By the way, you can actually hover over something and if you press the F1 button when you hover over it, it will actually open up a, a website leading to Blender which will tell you exactly what the thing is that you're actually doing. So really, really handy to actually uh, use that as well. So it's just F1 if you're hovering over something. Most of the things in the UI as well work like that. So that makes it really easy. Now I'm doing is I'm trying to create a um, some water and we're making some caustics on top of the water. Again, this water, it should be um, fairly uh, simple, um, just a fairly simple moving backwards and forwards. Uh, in fact, on this one, we didn't actually do that. We used actual drivers. And you'll see that when you use drivers, you can actually create variations in the movement of the um, of the actual texture. The other thing by using drivers, so it's a frame uh, divided by uh, 30 or something like that to create a driver. Um, is that you can actually not only get variations, but you can get it very quickly. In other words, you're not having to put in a load of keyframes because what you're doing by using that driver is you're actually putting in 15 keyframes at a time. So that's why you use it. It moves this much by this much, and it's this many keyframes is what you're doing there. So a really good technique to, to get into using drivers as well on things like this. And you'll see now, I'm just gonna mess around with it a bit more. Now, I, I did on the final render, change this again. So again, water is one of those things where it needs a lot of uh, playing around with it. You can get it you know, nearly right in the beginning, but you just need to play around a lot with it as, uh, as you go on. So now we're just creating some little dinky swords, uh, some swords and axes, and they're basically gonna be on the table and that's what he will have worked on. Again, more storytelling, and they don't take long to create these. You can see they're very easy, just dragging out mesh, using insert, um, using some uh, edge loops, control R, things like that, and then beveling that to pummel off a little bit with control B, and then changing the shape of how actually I want it to uh, look. So you can see there, change the shape, brought up uh, the amount of uh, uh, bevels on there. And then that's simple as that, bringing some different type of metal, or did I use the chain? I think I used the chain actually for metal because we made that pretty shiny, so. And now onto the ax. And pretty much at this stage, we've near enough done with the actual build. 
Um, so I think the rest of it, um, after a few more things that we build, is down to mainly lighting then. So that's something that you should really take the time to actually learn about, especially the Blender Compositor as well, because it does make things much, much easier, because you're not so reliant then on things like Photoshop or anything like that to create a, you know, the kind of look for the scene that you actually want. Okay, just going in, adding the final touches, so some more bricks going around the house. It's looking a bit sparse without those, and you can see, actually brings a lot of life to the house, as you can see. Just change the uh, gradient on some of them, making them look a bit different, not all the same, or anything like that. And now we just want a fire in there. So, fire basically is, you're going to use an empty and it's going to um, you're going to keyframe it with the display so that displaced object is going to be based on that empty when that empty then moves up the actual mesh will kind of ripple and that's the look you're going for so you'll see in a minute as i pull that up now that mesh is uh, rippling and that's the first part of this because from there then you can actually create nodes which actually create the look of fire but that actual empty is doing kind of most of the work it's actually rippling up then when I bring, um, I bring in three actually, so three of these uh, pieces of fire, all of different colours. So we've got red, we've got orange, we've got white, we combine them together and then they look as though they're rippling and disappearing, as you'll see in a minute. So at the moment now I'm trying to get all of the colours into the actual uh, fire. Not only the colours, you can also see there that I need to give it some transparency, so in other words, fire you'll notice as it ripples up it looks you see gaps in it and that's what we're actually going for here and you'll see once i've actually put this all together that's why i actually create all right so let's bring in some color and again if you slow this down you should be able to see what i'm actually doing there's nothing cut out of uh, this or anything like that And now what I'm doing is I'm putting basically, like we've got large frames in here, we've got small frames and really tiny frames, so I'm actually giving those um, all different drivers. And there you go, I've just uh, brought one in now, I've duplicated it and bringing it around. Now there was a problem when I brought this in, first of all, when I changed the actual colour, didn't actually work for some reason, but now it, now it did. So it, it's like there's a bug or something where it doesn't work straight away, it takes a bit of time to come in. So now you can see we're getting somewhere. So we've got our, you know, our hot um, fire in the kind of center. So now we're gonna have some white ones. And you can see they're messed around with the mesh and still the same actual um, empty is driving all of this. So whether it's a small mesh, big mesh, it doesn't matter, it's gonna drive it all. And there you go. Now you can see that's really how easy it is to create that. Now the only thing I would say about this is it's a little bit, maybe it's a little bit pointy. Maybe it shouldn't be quite so pointy. So I could have gone in and actually fixed that. Alright, so I brought in a cockerel um, silhouette. Just You can find that on the Google. Cut around it with K and the knife tool. Make sure though that you don't cut around it as accurately as the actual silhouette is. We are going for a stylized look here. Bring it in, right click and uh, triangulate faces. Extrude it out. There's your cockerel, as simple as that, really, really easy. Give him something to stand on, and then all we're gonna do is we're just gonna bring in, I think, one or two bones, and then just move him left and right in the wind. Because basically, it's, it's supposed to be a wind direction or something like that. I was gonna bring in, um, you know, kind of west, north, south, and all that stuff, but in the end, I just decided to just bring in a simple arrow. Use the mirror, make sure your clipping's on. If you don't have that on, they're not actually gonna join up in the center. Extrude that out and there you go. Pretty much done very easily. And there's two bones. One of them will be the root bone as we always do. And then the second one will be weighted to the cockerel and the actual arrow. Again, it's based over 180 frames because that is what I decided in the beginning to base my frames over. Now they don't have to actually uh, all go to 180 frames. You can actually go and set every animation independent. So within the independence of each one, one might be 180, another one might be 220, and all that will happen is the other one will restart again. Now the problem you're gonna have is if you've got one at 180, 
if you want to, you know, add in another um, animation that's a different frame, you need to make sure that it's going to like 360 or something. It's basically double what the other one is. And the reason for that is if not, it will actually start halfway through. So just take that into account. Now we're adding the final finishing touches to the house. Of course the house, it wouldn't just be sat on, you know, just the wall, this roof. It has to have some wood underneath it like that. So just the final bit so that if we take it from a different angle, it doesn't look like it's floating there or something. We make the floor then a little bit darker, turn down the roughness, and finally now we're on to actually bringing our lights in. So, we've got everything done, we're bringing in a main light, um, I think we're bringing a main light, bringing in a floor because it's important you have a floor because it bounces that light back up, so you're going to need that. And then all they do is I change that main directional light to an actual area light, and now start giving it some color. So, the front of it, I want it to be kind of this, uh, yellowish color because there's a lot of fire there's a lot of molten metal and things like that and then around the back i want it to be something like moonlight or something like that we don't actually want this scene um too um you know light or too dark basically is what i'm saying so we've got a happy medium there using area there you go you can see what kind of look we're actually going for there we could have made it a lot brighter but i think it really did it nice uh, the blues and the actual orange um, a tertiary actual um, render then, so I always do the first render, turn it all the way down, something like 20. Get an idea how this thing's actually going to be rendered out, what it's going to look like before I do anything else. And you can see, once I've done that render, I could see straight away that there were issues in the, you know, with the water and things like that. Alright, so now I think we come up to our final render. And there we go, final render, and now, I'm hoping, we go to our composite. Alright, just making sure everything works. There's the render, we need to pull the floor out, and now I'm going to the composite. So as I said, composite, really, really amazing. First of all, we're going to bring in a glare, and that's to bring out the emission. So, um, basically, it's... On Blender you can't actually, inside because you can't actually have blue, so the glare actually does that for us. Then we've got a soften as well, we've also got a sharpen to sharpen up the image, and here is the final image. We've also messed around with a bit of the colour bands. you'll see at the end of this render how it looks, and then it'll quickly jump to what we've done with the compositor. So this, what you're seeing right now, is how it would look once it's rendered, and now the compositor gets to work. And there you go, we've got that foggy type of atmosphere. We've got this, um, you know, beautiful render there, as you can see. And that's basically it, guys. So I really hope you enjoyed that. We actually put a lot of work into this to make it really concise. Make sure we, you know, brought a lot of life to our actual uh, scene and things like that. So let us know in the comments below what you thought, what we could have covered more, what you'd like to see. Um, and I'll see you on the next one. Don't forget, you can get everything we show here, basically for the price of a cup of coffee, with our Patreon. So think about having at least checking that out, seeing what we have to offer. You can also get all of the blend files that we actually put out and download them, you know, whenever you want them and things like that. All right, everyone, so I hope you enjoyed that, and I'll see you on the next one. Happy modeling, everyone. Bye-bye.